Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton, and today I'm hanging out in the woods in a beautiful pristine area full of eastern hemlock trees and black birch trees and yellow birch trees, oak trees, magnolia trees, and tulip trees, and I'm specifically looking for small mushrooms in these woods. Now why in the world would I be looking for small mushrooms? Well, I value small mushrooms just as much as I value the big conspicuous mushrooms. You know, size of a mushroom really doesn't determine its importance in an ecosystem. Just because a mushroom produces small fruiting bodies doesn't mean it's not as essential as a mushroom that produces big fruiting bodies to an ecosystem that looks like this. And so I consider these small mushrooms to be the unsung heroes of the forest. And although these mushrooms are often overlooked, they're actually quite common. And you might have these mushrooms growing in a wooded area near you or perhaps even on your property. So if you're interested in learning more about some of these small mushrooms that inhabit a forest that looks like this, take a walk with me and I'll introduce you to some. Okay, so I found some really, really small mushrooms fruiting from this really interesting substrate. Now, in order to get a species identification of this mushroom, or even a genus, we kind of have to know something about this substrate. We have to know something about this tree as well. So I'll tell you what genus this belongs to, and this genus is Strobilurus. Strobilurus comes from the word strobilus, which means pine cone, because some members of the Strobilurus genus fruit from the cones of members of the Pinaceae family. Now, this is not a pine cone. This is not a pine tree. This is a magnolia seed pod from the cucumber magnolia tree, which is this one right here. So this species fruits exclusively on the seed pods of magnolia trees, and it has been reported to grow in the fruit capsules of sweet gum trees. So Strobilurus is a genus that represents about 11 species worldwide, and this is the only one that does grow on magnolia seed pods. So if you have a magnolia tree and you live in eastern North America and Panama, because this mushroom has also been reported to grow in Panama, then you might have this mushroom. So this is the magnolia cone mushroom, Strobilurus coniginoides. If you're interested in finding the magnolia cone mushroom, the best piece of advice I have for you is to simply look for magnolia trees. Look for magnolia trees, look in the ground beneath the magnolia trees, look for the spent seed pods, and look for mushrooms fruiting from them late summer through fall, even in the spring months, and you may find Strobilurus caniginoides. Now where I live in Pennsylvania, we have three native magnolia trees, two non-native but naturalized, and those species are from Asia. And if you're wondering where the name magnolia comes from, it comes from the French botanist who actually had a killer wig, and his name was Pierre Magnol, who botanized in the 1600s and in the 1700s. Now this tree right here is the cucumber magnolia tree, Magnolia acuminata. It's considered to be widely distributed, but rarely abundant. Primarily occurs in the Appalachian Belt in Eastern North America in rich forests. And I don't see too many of these trees when I'm walking through the woods. I see a couple of them scattered, but rarely, if ever, do I see pure stand. It's usually mixed in with a bunch of other hardwoods and some conifers as well. So remember, if you're looking for this mushroom, you wanna look for magnolia trees, look on the ground beneath the magnolia trees, look for these spent seed pods, and you too may have the good fortune of finding Strobilurus caniginoides. What's interesting about this mushroom, besides all that stuff that I just mentioned, is that there is some medicinal research on some Strobilurus species showing that they may have antifungal compounds known as Strobilurins, and there's specifically two that have been isolated, Strobilurin A and Strobilurin B. So what a beautiful intimate relationship that this mushroom has formed with the magnolia tree. And think how important this relationship is because without this fungus, a lot of these nutrients in this magnolia seed pod might have a difficult time being recycled through this ecosystem. So thank the universe for Strobilurus caniginoides. And before we move on, there's another mushroom with Strobilus in the name. This is Strobilomyces right here. You might be familiar with this mushroom, which is Old Man of the Woods. So we had Strobilurus, Strobilomyces. Strobilus comes from pine cone. And the cap of Old Man of the Woods is kind of like a pine cone. Maybe, if you stretch your imagination. But unfortunately, this is a big mushroom. We're only talking about small mushrooms today. So let's put this one down. Even though it is edible, we're gonna move on and look for some other small mushrooms in these woods. Okay, if you thought those mushrooms were small, Strobilurus caniginoides, wait till you see these fungi right here. They're so small that we have to take a closer look. 
to see just how small they really are. You can see them fruiting in between the bark of this tree. Now, this fungus, which I'm going to tell you the identity of in just a couple of seconds, is almost always reported to grow on basswood trees, on dead basswood trees. Basswood is in the Tilia genus. And I thought that this might be a basswood tree because I saw these fungi and I thought, yeah, that's what I read, that this fungus almost always fruits on dead basswood trees. Then I followed this log to its source and I could see that it was sharing a trunk with a cucumber magnolia tree, Magnolia cuminata. So this is probably another cucumber magnolia tree. I could be wrong, I often am, but I would say for now that this is probably cucumber magnolia. So we're seeing a lot of fungi fruiting from magnolia trees today. And this actually isn't incredibly rare for this fungus to do this because this fungus has also been reported to grow on maple and ash and elm trees and some other trees as well. So which fungus is this? Well, this has the common name of matchsticks, and I like to call them Hawaiian matchsticks, only because the genus is Hawaii, but it's spelled a little differently. So this is Hawaii mucida. You can call them matchsticks, you can call them whatever you want, actually, because the fungus doesn't care, and I don't really care either. But just for fun, I like to call them Hawaiian matchsticks. Now, what's really fascinating about this fungus is that it actually has two different stages where it produces spores. It has an asexual stage, and it has a sexual stage. And so the particular structures that you're looking at right now they represent only the asexual reproductive stage of this species. And known mycologically as the anamorph stage, the club-shaped structures that you're looking at, particularly the gray heads, produce specialized asexual spores known as conidia. And the scientific name given to this asexual stage of the fungus is Crinula caliciformis. Now the sexual reproductive stage of this fungus does exist and it doesn't really look anything like these white-tipped club-shaped sticks. I actually don't see it on this log right now. I'm looking for it, but I don't see it. All we see are these asexual club-shaped structures. But the sexual stage, it looks more like a little black jelly cup, about a quarter of an inch to three quarters of an inch wide. And I actually don't see any of them on this log right here, so unfortunately I can't show you them. But that stage is known as the teleomorph stage, and it's responsible for producing sexual spores known as ascospores. So this is the anamorphic stage, and the sexual stage is the teleomorphic stage, which we can't see right now. Now, interestingly, this fungus has been the subject of a lot of controversy and debate over the past couple of centuries. You know, you thought that people would just be debating politics and religion and diet and all these other things, but not the name of this fungus. Who would have thought that this little thing called matchsticks would be the subject of so much debate? And the debate was because there are two different stages, the anamorph stage, the teleomorphic stage, that don't look like one another, but different names, different scientific names have been given to both stages. And what's so interesting is that even though this fungus is an ascomycete, it produces sexual ascospores, so it's an ascomycotid division, in 1860 this mushroom was put in a genus of basidiomycetes, in the basidiomycota division. And that genus is Dityola a genus of jelly fungi. So this was kind of considered to be a jelly fungus in a completely different division of fungi that aren't closely related to ascomycetes. But then in 1889, it was given the ascomycete genus, which is Hawaii, so this is Hawaii mucida, and it's been this way for a very long time. And so it's had many names for the anamorphic stage, it's had many names for the teleomorphic stage. Over the past couple of decades, there's been a strong push to only assign one name to a fungus, and so this whole phenomenon is called one fungus, one name. And so taxonomists are trying to do this with all fungi. They're not too successfully, but fortunately they've been successful with this one. So they're just assigning it that teleomorphic name, which is Hawaii mucida. And if you're wondering where the genus and species names come from, well, the genus name Hawaii comes from a man named Edward Willett Dorland Holway, who was a banker turned naturalist late 1800s, early 1900s, who collected more than 19,000 plant and fungal specimens in his lifetime. And mucida means moldy or musty, perhaps in reference to these gray or whitish heads that are full of these asexual conidial spores. Let's continue our search for some more small mushrooms. Okay, so continuing our search for very small mushrooms in these woods, I came across another interesting and beautiful specimen fruiting from this water-soaked wood right here. Do you see all these little fruiting bodies, these brown ones, these copper-colored fruiting bodies that kind of look like jelly fungi, but it's not a jelly fungus. It's not closely related to a jelly fungus, even though it kind of looks like it. You can see it up close right here. This is the copper penny fungus. Ever hear of the copper penny fungus before? Pachyella clipiata. In the species name, clipiata shares the same root as clipius, which was a 
circular Roman shield used as a piece of defensive armor. You can kind of make that comparison to this fruiting body right here, though unfortunately I don't think this thing is protecting me from anything today, not even from ticks. Now the Pachyella genus is rather large, at least a dozen species worldwide. This is considered to be one of the largest species in the Pachyella genus, but there are actually a lot of species that look identical to the naked eye, so sometimes you need microscopy. Put this thing underneath the microscope in order to tell which species you have. And this one will have smooth spores. No ornamentation, no dots, or no ornamentation in the form of warts around those spores. Smooth spores. And I put the species underneath the microscope before and I saw that it does have smooth spores. So Pachyella clipiata, the copper penny fungus. Now there's an interesting word used to describe this fungus, this genus of fungi, and other fungi that share similar features, similar morphological features, and fruiting habits. And that word is silopezioid. So some people refer to these fungi as silopezioid fungi. Have you ever heard of that word before? It's not too commonly used today, not even by mycologists that I know. Maybe I'm just not in the loop, but you see in older mycological literature the term silopezioid fungi. These are fungi that are typically stalkless, that are broadly attached to a substrate, that are cushion shaped or shallowly cup shaped. And the key feature for silopezioid fungi is that they typically fruit on wet or water soaked or submerged wood and plant debris. And this is a very wet log right here. I can almost push right through it. This log is almost kept in a perpetual state of wetness. And it doesn't really dry out even if there hasn't been any rain for a long period of time. So it's no surprise that we're seeing these gelatinous fruit bodies right here, even though it's not a jelly fungus. And you gotta believe me when I say we haven't had rain in a very long time, but you can see how moist and jelly-like these fungi look. So it's probably getting a lot of that, perhaps from this water-soaked wood. So silopezioid fungi, that's the term used to describe this genus and some other genera as well. Now the copper penny fungus can resemble a wood ear mushroom or maybe even an amber jelly roll, but those fungi are basidiomycetes. So their spores are born on structures known as basidia. If you put this one under a microscope, you'll clearly see the difference because this is in the ascomycota division, the copper penny fungus is. So it has aside, these tube or sock-like structures, and inside those structures are sexual ascospores. There are many of those spores inside those tubes. So this is an ascomycete wood ear mushroom or amber jelly roll or the other jelly fungi. Those are basidiomycetes. It wouldn't be a deadly mistake to harvest this one, but I don't think the edibility of the copper penny fungus is known. It just doesn't look like it would provide much food value. But it's a beautiful fungus. It's an ecologically important fungus, and I hope you can get out there, find your very first copper penny fungus if you haven't seen one already. Let's go see if we can find at least one more small mushroom. Okay, so on the same log where I found Pachyella clipiata, the copper penny fungus, a little further down I found this interesting, often overlooked, little black cup fungus right here. And actually right above it is another interesting small creature. This is in the Steminitis genus. This is the chocolate tube slime. This is a slime mold. And even though mold is in its name and even though it does produce spores, it's not considered to be a true fungus. But right above it is the copper penny fungus, Pachyella clipiata. Let's move our attention down here and talk about this beautiful and interesting black cup fungus. Unfortunately, this thing does not have a common name, so you can make one up, because remember, even all scientific names are made up. But this one does have a beautiful scientific name. Kind of rolls right off the tongue, and it's Ionomydotus irregularis. Ionomydotus irregularis. Unfortunately, this mushroom isn't commonly included in many field guides. Most people aren't finding it because they don't even know what it is. They don't know what to look for. But there are a couple ways to positively identify it. We'll get to that in a couple seconds. But let's talk about the genus and species name. So the species name, Irregularis, refers to the irregularly shaped lobes of this fungus. So it's easy to see why it's called Irregularis. Ionomydotus might not be so obvious, but the old genus name used to be Mydotus. And Mydotus comes from King Midas, who in Greek mythology was given the ears of a donkey, the long ears of a donkey, for not appreciating Apollo's music. So because he didn't appreciate the music, he was given long ears of a donkey. So the moral of the story is don't diss someone's music or else you might be given ears of a donkey that kind of look like these fruiting structures right here. They're kind of elongated like ears. Now there are a couple ways to positively identify this in the field even though it kind of looks like other black cup fungi and it might seem almost impossible to get to a positive identification just by looking at it but it's growing directly on wood. It's growing in clusters and also if you look closely you'll see this buff colored powder that does rub off on these surfaces. You really see it in the smaller specimens as the fungus matures, it does get worn off, but you will still see it even in older specimens. 
So those key features do point towards Iona mitotis irregularis. Now this fungus is fascinating for so many reasons and there's one more I'll share with you. And the reason is there's a chemical reaction that's used in mycology to successfully classify mushrooms, taxonomically speaking, that's named after this genus. So this genus is Iona mitotis and the reaction is the Iona mitotic reaction. This was first described in 1958. And the reaction is you apply aqueous potassium hydroxide to various cup fungi and you might see the exudation of violet pigments. And if you see that, then that's a useful taxonomic tool used by mycologists to classify some mushrooms in the Iona mitotis genus and other related genera. So this mushroom is very important. It's important to mycologists for taxonomy. It's also important as a decomposer of wood. So I'm happy to see it today growing alongside Steminitis and also Pachyella. <music> Okay, if you made it this far in the video, then I applaud you and I'll reward you for sticking around this long by showing you some big mushrooms. Now, I know we talked a lot about small mushrooms in this video, but here's some big mushrooms that I just couldn't pass up. I just wanted to show you really quickly before we wrap up this video. But I guess we could consider this one to be a small one, right? Because it's about a quarter the size of this big one right here. Which mushroom is this? Well, this is the destroying angel and the Amanita bisporogera group. So a deadly poisonous mushroom you definitely do not want to consume these mushrooms. But these are just as important to this ecosystem as all those other small mushrooms that we talked about. For similar reasons, you know, they're food for mycophagous animals and insects, but also for different reasons. These mushrooms are ectomycorrhizal, forming mutualistic symbioses with various trees in this area. All those other fungi we talked about were largely saprotrophic species. They help to decompose material. So beautiful fungi, ecologically important fungi. Let's all be grateful for all the roles that they're doing, all that we know about them, and all that we just don't know yet. Thank you so much for watching this video. I truly appreciate it. I hope you learned something. If you enjoyed this video and you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, feel free to subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. We can also stay in touch by the email newsletter. I send out updates periodically, maybe once or twice a month. You can find that at learnyourland.com and you can also follow me on social media, on Facebook and Instagram at Learn Your Land. Thanks again. I'll see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.